Okay, so I think I'm going to get started. So my name is Thomas. I'm working for IBM for the Cloud and Smarter Infrastructure Organization in the CTO office. And with me is Lakshmi, a colleague from IBM Research, and we are going to talk about heat and enterprise applications. Uh, before we go into details, I want to do some level set about what to expect from this uh, presentation. First of all, some terminology. What, what do we mean with application orchestration? And when you talk about app, uh, orchestration, many people think about different things and about different levels of details. In our presentation, we uh, talk about the deployment or we, we understand the deployment of application components, including the underlying infrastructure uh, and uh, also the management of a deployed application throughout its lifetime when we say application orchestration. Uh, um, when it comes to enterprise applications, it's typically large-scale deployments that have high uh, requirements on, on scalability, reliability, performance, and so on. Uh, in the presentation, we want to share experiences in that field uh, based on two solutions that we work on in IBM. So one is application orchestration and Smart Cloud Orchestrator, uh, which is actually based on the OASIS Tosca standard. And then Lakshmi will present a project called Viva, which is a higher level DSL, especially designed for uh, DevOps scenarios. And we want to relate this to Heat, of course, and show what, what we do today in addition to what Heat does today, but uh, also how we already can use current functionality and then uh, also outline what concepts we think are important for software orchestration and heat and uh, give a, well, a view on possible future directions. Um, I want to get started with a couple of examples uh, to well, give you a better feeling for what kinds of workloads we are talking about. Uh, based on those examples, I'm deriving some common requirements that we think are important for software orchestration. Um, then we will present our solutions that we have today for software orchestration and how we use heat in those solutions. And finally, just a couple of words on ongoing activities in the heat community. It's also important, I don't want to make this a design uh, proposal kind of presentation because that is done in the design discussion, so I won't, won't go down into those details, but just give you a, a brief uh, summary of the discussions that are going on. So uh, let's get started. So this is not actually a, well, I wouldn't call it an, a complex enterprise application, but I wanted to get started with this because this is known to everyone in the heat community. It's the, the famous WordPress example, but it already uh, allows uh, us to highlight what, what we think is important. So um, for software orchestration, it's important to us to have software components modeled explicitly instead of having everything collapsed into a script which is inlined into instance uh, user data uh, because that allows us to reuse things and also so we can reuse a, an Apache module in, a, uh, in another use case, we can reuse MySQL in another use case and it also makes sense to separate it from the actual application workload because uh, that, that uh, gives us a higher reuse factor. Um, looking at another um, aspect, if we want to make the, the web tier scalable, um, it has some impact on, on networking. So in this example, we, want, uh, we say this uh, thing, the application gets deployed into a private network. And if one thing is scalable, I have to care about things like load balancing. I have to care about floating IPs and so on. But uh, in order to keep the, the model portable, we actually don't want to model the low level details of, of, well, of networking. I don't want to go into floating IPs or into uh, neutron network resources, but I want to keep it very abstract um, because that allows us to, to have this much more portable because one, one provider might use a Nova network, another one would use um, a neutron, and, even, and then in neutron you can have very uh, different, uh, different layouts but to not hard code the model to watch what such a layout, we want to use uh, abstract modeling concepts. I have some more details uh, about this later on. Uh, next, uh, uh, it's getting more complex. So this uh, shows a multi-tier uh, SAP application that we also want to orchestrate. Um, 
three tiers, as I said, there's one server which is hosting the database instance and SAP has a couple of uh, storage volumes attached according to SAP practices. Then there's a, uh, a central instance, again a server which is hosting uh, a central host component that shares uh, configuration data and binaries with other components in the system than a sub-central instance where you basically log on and then which distributes the load to uh, dialogue instances, basically the worker nodes in an SAP system. And then there is a, a dialogue instance which is handling the actual user sessions. And uh, there's a connection between all of them via NFS. So typically the, the central host shares binaries, config data. Uh, the config data is used by the, by the database instance and the binaries and, and the config data are used by the uh, by the dialog instance. So it's quite complex graph of components and dependencies. And what's important, what I want to convey in this picture is that from the dependencies, if we have a well-defined uh, semantics, we can derive the complete processing flow. So starting from the bottom, uh, the servers don't have any dependencies among each other, so I can uh, deploy the complete infrastructure in parallel. I don't have to care about any synchronization. Uh, then. Uh, based on the relationships, we can basically walk up the tree. Um, so this thing is the next thing uh, that can be processed. It, uh, it only relies on the server being up and running, but it doesn't have dependencies on other things. Uh, next, uh, since this, uh, this component here uh, shares some data, when that one is up and running, we can export some uh, directories via NFS. Uh, once this, that has happened, we can process the other components on the, on the dialog instance and the database and mount uh, NFS shares. After that, we can uh, start a database because that one is depending on uh, config data shared via NFS. When that is running, the central instance can be started and finally, uh, the dialog instances can be started. Another important thing in, in such a model are connections uh, between components. And, and since, since that tier here is scaling, so I can have many dialog instances, I need a way to react to, to the scaling events because in the SAP case, I have to update profile configuration data on the central host so that other um, components in the system know about the new instance. So uh, to this connection, we have, we have some uh, signaling semantics attached. And by the way, this is powered by Oasis Tosca. So that's actually a model that has been built by SAP and a company called Renomic. So they built this according to a standard and we can run it in our, in our orchestrator today. Uh, the third example, and this is actually one where Lakshmi will uh, give some more de details later on, is a, an, a collaboration platform in IBM, IBM Connections, uh, which is based on WebSphere and uh, in, in this example, I want to highlight some requirements and placement policies, connectivity constraints, and so on. So the application consists, uh, or the, the deployment consists of a cluster of uh, application servers, WebSphere application server. Um, we have something called WebSphere Deployment Manager, which is a central component that you use for managing all your other components for deploying workloads, uh, so applications onto the application servers. and. Uh, we typically, or in a, in a production environment, we have many of those clusters and the deployment manager is connected to each of those. Um, then we have a web tier in front. In this example, two web servers that are to provide high availability and they route the traffic to the application servers. And in the back end, we have uh, an HA configuration for the database, or so two d databases that provide the data for the application. Now what's important here for production environments is that we have constraints on how to place the, all those nodes. So for one such cluster, so for this group here, we have an anti-collocation constraint that says uh, at most two of those nodes must end up on the same rack. And then for all of the application servers, we have an, a constraint that at most two must end up on the same physical machine. So that allows us to, to spread it, uh, to reach performance goals, and also to have, have high availability. The same here, so for the, uh, for the web servers, we want to have them on separate racks. Uh, for the database, uh, we, want to have it, uh, we want to have them on separate racks. And we also have constraints on the connection to the, to the storage volume, so it must be uh, directly attached storage to be uh, fast, and we have a, 
latency constraint on the database, uh, on, the, on the network connection between the two nodes uh, because the, the replication must work um, uh, very quickly uh, to have a hot failover uh, configuration. So there are a couple of constraints that influence how, the, how that model gets deployed into, into the infrastructure. So based on those examples I just explained, I'm going to summarize a couple of requirements that I already mentioned. So first of all, and most important, we uh, needed clear modeling of software components um, for the reasons I mentioned, ability to reuse things, and we basically want to have the software components also as stateful entities because an orchestrator must know when one component is up and running so that it can start with the next component. Um, we have some uh, dependencies with clear semantics uh, defined and that allows us to derive the processing flow. And uh, for multi-instance components, like many instances of a cluster member within a cluster, there might be a special constraint. For example, in the case of WebSphere, we cannot uh, uh, join all members to a cluster in one shot, but we have to do it one by one. That's just a, well, a thing that, that uh, must be followed in WebSphere because you cannot uh, join them, uh, the, the nodes parallel because they depend on updates of the configuration data, of the cluster-wide configuration data. Um, to ensure portability of uh, application models, uh, we think it should be possible and uh, we think it's a, a best practice to tell an orchestrator as much uh, as necessary about the infrastructure, but as little as possible. So not go down into details about port configurations, about VLANs or subnets and so on, but just uh, keep it at, a, at an abstract level. And finally, in, in many scenarios, we have uh, requirements on placement, so there's a requirement for the concept of policies. And then, well, all of that was uh, primarily uh, looking at uh, deployment, uh, but Deployment is only a very tiny fraction in the life cycle of an enterprise application. In SAP, so SAP guys, for example, told us that the deployment is about 7% of the life cycle of, a, of an SAP system. And when we want to manage the application after the deployment, we have to think about scaling, uh, and especially scaling uh, based on application metrics. So in many cases, it's not enough to look at CPU load or memory, but we have to look at uh, transaction rate, number of concurrent user sessions in a system, and that then drives uh, the, the, the scaling on the infrastructure level. Um, we need to be able to properly handle events like scaling, failover, or any changes to the topology on the application level, because just uh, uh, spinning up another server, or activating a software component is not enough, but in many cases you really have to update other software components in the system to make it aware of, of the new component. Updates should be possible for long-running application, ideally online or in a, in a rolling manner. And finally, you can also have complete custom flows that you maybe cannot even express just in a topology model, but you uh, need the ability to have like a workflow orchestration system work with the instance data of the, of the deployed application. So now let's talk about on, uh, some, some solutions that we have for addressing uh, those scenarios. Uh, the one I'm going to talk about is based on Smart Cloud Orchestrator. And here I'm just showing a, a very high level view. So Smart Cloud Orchestrator has uh, a pattern management component that uh, well, has understanding of patterns and can do software orchestration. It makes use of an automation library, so a library that contains the installables, the script, uh, automation modules uh, and so on. Also like the schema definitions of components of what properties they have, how they can be changed. Um, it sits on top of an infrastructure management layer for, well, for giving us VMs, uh, IP addresses and so on. And that actually talks to the OpenStack APIs to create servers. Um, and then there's a, a workflow orchestration component that can interact with the deployed patterns or you can also do some pre-processing and post-processing uh, by means of workflows. And uh, we support the Tosca standard so we, you can feed Tosca models into the system and let it uh, manage uh, those, those patterns. So again, to tell you how the general flow is during deployment, the pattern, when you deploy a pattern, uh, for all the infrastructure resources, uh, a request goes to the infrastructure management layer, which then goes down to OpenStack, uh, 
um, OpenStack gives us the infrastructure resources, creates VMs, and it also bootstraps an agent inside the VMs, and then the agent uh, talks back to the automation library, so it, it downloads the instructions for how the software should be configured, and it also gets the information from the pattern what the dependencies between components are, and then sets up the complete software on top of the, of the infrastructure. Uh, you can have interaction with a workflow orchestration system, so either you do uh, pre-processing or post-processing, or you manage the application uh, throughout its, uh, its lifetime. Uh, next, I want to have a closer look at uh, the, the infrastructure, so the software-defined infrastructure handling in the system, and that's where I actually come to the re relation to heat, to where heat is really helpful already uh, today. So we have that infrastructure management layer, and that is um, the, the current design is that it requires some uh, setup of pools, it requires setup of networks and IP groups, so pools of IP addresses that can be assigned to, to the VMs. It also requires uh, the pre-allocation of storage pools. And then out of those pools, it uh, allocates resources for, for the pattern deployments. And what we want to do is to add more flexibility to that infrastructure layer. For example, we want to be more dynamic. We won't have to have custom creation of networks on the fly instead of just relying on uh, pre-existing networks. We want to have richer set of uh, topologies, and we have, want to have uh, support for more types of infrastructure resources. So we thought, how can we solve it without implementing all that complexity in our infrastructure management layer? So what we did is we thought, well, heat does all this for us, so we don't have to implement it, and that makes life much more easier. So um, let me show you how we, how we do this. Um, the use case, for the use case, I'm again using this SAP system, and let's assume we have, we got this pattern from SAP, that's for a multi-tier CRM system. It has identical configuration for each uh, trainee in, in, a, in a class, uh, so that they can all use the same documentation and can follow the instructor. Uh, an important thing is that the uh, SAP system ID is also included in that fixed configuration. Now, it, the thing with SAP systems is that a, an SAP system with the same system ID can only exist once within a network because they, there are discovery things happening on the network and you can deploy the first system but the second one won't, will, won't come up if you use the same system ID uh, or it will even corrupt the other system. So what you can do is to deploy each of the, of the SAP systems into a different network. So. Uh, the pattern includes the definition that each uh, system should go into its own private network, and then you give the well, the floating IP to access the system to the uh, to the respective classroom participant. Now, how do we do we treat this? Uh, we are using Neutron um, in in uh, OpenStack uh, for the purpose. So we have a, a base setup like uh, the, uh, the, the base tenant network. And for each system, we want to create a new network and deploy it into its own network. So we basically treat the complete pattern as two different parts. So we, we tear it apart into an infrastructure part and into the software part. And then for the, software, for the infrastructure part, we create a hot pattern and uh, give that hot pattern to, uh, to heat. And the hot pattern basically contains the definitions of the VMs, the networking uh, definition, the, the, the volume definition, and also bootstrapping information for, for, well, for bootstrapping our agent. And then he takes that one and brings us from here to there, so it creates a new network uh, with the VMs in that network, and when the VMs are up and running, our agents uh, get bootstrapped, and then they connect back to the, to the software orchestration layer and pull down the information about uh, the upper part in that pattern and uh, set up uh, the software uh, on top of heat. And what's interesting is, uh, so that those are screenshots for that scenario uh, taken from, from dashboard. So for the thing that looked pretty simple uh, in the pattern, so in our, in our pattern editor, we get 20 OpenStack resources. And this is a, a screenshot of the topology view in Havana, which, uh, well, you cannot see 
what uh, in that screenshot what the resources are, but it already shows it's pretty complex. So there are a lot of dependencies between the resources, and uh, uh, you have to care a lot about when they, how they are created, how the parameters are passed, and heat uh, does all that for us. So observations from the prototype, as I just mentioned, heat brings uh, enormous value for the infrastructure setup. So uh, in this use case, we use 10 resource types, uh, 10 types of OpenStack resources that heat supports. And there are many dependencies between the resources. And uh, we didn't have to implement this in, in our infrastructure management layer, but we could hand off all this complexity to heat and basically just do one call instead of doing uh, quite a number of calls. And it also, well, it reduces the complexity and it also offloads a lot of processing to heat that we don't have to do in our uh, stack. Um, next observation is that, well, as I mentioned, a relatively simply pattern from a user point of view uh, turned into a pretty complex infrastructure setup. So if you, well, and if you follow the best practices to keep the, the infrastructure uh, model abstract, you can make the, the pattern much more portable. Uh, so in the pattern, we just had the notion of a network uh, to symbolize that uh, each system should go into its own network, but we didn't define like neutron networks and subnets and ports and routers and router gateways and so on, uh, but we kept it abstract. And one thing where heat is also helpful is that it has the concept of provider templates. So you can uh, have different uh, provider templates, that's a, that's a heat terminology where you have uh, lower level resources defined and you can use that as a more abstract concept in another template, which allows you to, for example, uh, switch from Nova network to Neutron or between different Neutron uh, configurations that you want to use in your data center. And then finally, the agent bootstrapping allowed us to do software orchestration on heat as it exists today. And the software orchestration works because we have the dependency handling and everything in our engine today. Uh, what we are currently discussing uh, with the complete heat community is to add more uh, capabilities for software orchestration so that heat also handles the dependencies between software components. And then it will work the same for other software configuration providers. So Chef, Puppet, or Simple Scripts can also be deployed as software components, and then if he does the orchestration, we can um, maybe reach the same functionality. Um, finally, I want to say something about autonomic behavior. So in, in that prototype we built, we actually can have uh, autonomic behavior in two different layers. So our Asian framework uh, can do things like scaling or, or, or monitoring of components. It can uh, trigger failover behavior. And it can do this also based on application metrics. So you can have agents uh, configured uh, to, to monitor application transaction rate and throughput and user sessions and so on. And then it can trigger scaling in the infrastructure. In heat, you can also do auto scaling. Uh, but today, at least what you get out, out of the box, it's based on infrastructure metrics, so like CPU and memory load. Uh, I guess. Uh, more will be possible with uh, the Solometer integration, but what you get out of the box is infrastructure scaling. Now, if you would enable both, you get a conflict because if there are two chiefs in the house, they, well, they will compete with each other. So what we are doing to solve that for now is that we don't use heat uh, uh, order scaling, but we do the, the monitoring completely in, in our layer of the, of the stack, and then we use the stack update functionality to trigger the addition of another server um, uh, from, the, from the application layer. Um, at this point, I will hand over to Lakshmi, but maybe stop uh, uh, to see if there are any questions. All right, then I hand over to Lakshmi to tell you a little bit about Vivo, which is another technology for, for software orchestration. Thank you. Uh, so just to give you some background, this is a project we started at IBM Research about uh, two and a half years back. And uh, the goal was to, s we realized that um, deployment automation is only uh, one part of a bigger puzzle or a bigger piece. 
and uh, this uh, continuous integration, continuous deployment uh, provides a very strong um, use case or scenario for deployment automation. And most of the time, we have found when talking to customers or people, they are ready to actually take the effort or time to build a model to automate their deployment only for the benefits they get later on in terms of such continuous deployment or continuous integration. Um, so given that uh, from day one, Weaver was born in the DevOps world, so we, uh, uh, so to, it's, uh, okay, I shouldn't look down, I think. Um, it's, it's a Ruby-based DSO, and uh, we made the conscious choice of having, uh, preferring a code as compared to having a visual description, we felt, and uh, many people really liked having a concise description. So it's a Ruby-based DSO for continuous deployment, and um, it enables or it allows uh, the developers and the ops folks to come together and describe what they want for deployment. So there are parts of applications that are described, application components. So what you see uh, in this side is an application developer's role who, desc who uh, describes the application components, for example, a database component or a web server component, et cetera. And uh, then you have the ops side of the puzzle, which where uh, an ops specialist would describe the infrastructure components. So here, infrastructure could be just virtual resources, network uh, resource, physical network resources, or uh, even middleware components for that matter. And then the ops folks and the app folks would sit together, or the dev folks, and then kind of bind or map application components onto the middleware and infrastructure components. And as you would know, this could be, that could be multiple mappings, one for a test environment in which probably you want to map all the application components onto a single, say, a virtual machine. And for a production, you would want a different. So what it allows us is to nicely capture the variations in terms of different deployment scenarios in this environment topology and then keep these two pieces separate so that they could be independently reused. And so it enables separation of concerns in terms of dev folks describing what they want and the ops folks describing what they want independently. And also it allows reuse of those pieces independently. So a given deployment is described in this DSL using these three different components. And then it is actually um, there is a compiler that takes this model, compiles, do, does some dependence analysis, and uh, does some validation, and then does a deployment. So currently it can deploy to EC2, to OpenStack, and a couple of other clouds. So what I w want to talk here is um, we wanted to both validate our premise that these kind of different views are needed, and they really add value what better way than to actually apply it on a big application. So what we did was we took this IBM connections, uh, and Thomas already presented a, a picture of this earlier, and uh, this is an application that is uh, reasonably large, has all kinds of traditional enterprise components, and um, also it is actually used by thousands of IBMers every day. So it's a real application. So one of the advantage was, hence, we could go and grab the ops folks and the dev folks and bring them together and ask them to describe their pieces of this bigger puzzle. So that way, one could really validate. It was not an easy thing, but we, we getting all of them to actually do that because there is both a lot of inertia as well as a lot of legacy stuff that they have. And they continuously question, is it really worth it? So at the end of the experiment, uh, we were happy to see that they were convinced reasonably that it was, it is really worthwhile. So in a sense, it's a validation for Heath's uh, um, goal too, right? This is a DSL we explored, but Heath is aiming at the same thing, the same space, and uh, um, eventually it will be this dev and the ops folks who will be together working on developing Heat templates and deploying them. So that's kind of the bigger context. And uh, th this application, so let me see how am I doing. I have five more minutes, okay. Um, basically, it's, it consists of WebSphere application nodes, which are grouped into clusters, what you're seeing in the middle. 
and it has these web servers on the front and uh, a database node and an NFS server on the back. And it has constraints in terms of availability. Uh, so a couple of constraints is the co-location and anti-co-location policies that Thomas already covered. So I'll skip those and um, go to this one. What, what are the difficulties we faced? So first, this was all done manually using a bunch of like, uh, uh, for example, uh, even the installation of, of this whole application is using some per custom installers. So there is no visibility into these installation and hence it, it took a while to actually derive all the dependencies and put them all in a reasonable automation and structure so that actually this could be automated. So we wanted to not just automate running those scripts, we wanted to actually go deep and automate um, the wiring of the infrastructure components as well as wiring of the application components all automatically. So, uh, and uh, l like I mentioned earlier, um, the agility requirements actually motivated um, uh, the effort in the sense they really uh, were doing very slow releases. They wanted to do offer like more frequent releases of, their, uh, of the connections app and also maintaining the configurations across releases, versioning them, et cetera, was getting very hard. So uh, with, with all the availability and performance requirements. So what I'm showing here is uh, a, a snippet of the bigger description of this application. What I want to highlight here is um, one could ask why use a DSL. And um, one of the things that a DSL brings is very concise specification. And uh, what, what I'm showing here is you saw this four clusters, right? So one could, so this is a Ruby-based DSL and it's a uh, loop in Ruby that allows you to succinctly say that this is what I want. Now imagine you are deploying a big Hadoop application and you want like hundreds of nodes. And each node has, uh, let's say, an IP that is based on its ID, which is something that is part of this numbering. Then you could easily specify all those things very concisely as compared to having a spec that is really unrolled in the sense of replicated. So uh, again, this is uh, related. The second thing is it also allows you to actually attach um, uh, external scripts. Uh, here in this case, we use Chef as uh, uh, configuration management tool, it allows you to attach uh, external uh, automations to the node so that it could be directly leveraged. One of the design principles we had in the, we have is to be able to use automation off the shelf in the sense the community writes chef scripts, one should be able to just take it and use it. And uh, which means we cannot expect them to change anything in the script. And that really paid off for us later on because when we asked these folks to bring their scripts that they use today, they could just reuse them. Otherwise, changing the scripts is, is a big nightmare. So it, it, it allows us to do that. And one of the things that allows us to do that is actually uh, the include and also this kind of late binding. This is a way to express that a value that is actually used for some configuration is actually going to be produced by one of the entities that is created during a deployment. So we distinguish between values that are available when a deployment starts and values that are produced as a part of like creating a resource like an IP address or as a result of a software configuration like a URL or a port number that is produced. So this, this is a construct that we have that allows one to very neatly say that this is a late binding of a value to a value. And then uh, we have uh, the constraints that uh, Thomas also talked about, that, that's all attached. Moving on, I want to just highlight one more point, which is uh, the orchestration, software orchestration that is needed to do this deployment. And I'm just showing a small, in some sense, slice of the picture because I'm not showing all the values that flows in, there are quite a lot of them. And what I want to highlight is there is actually several layers of stuff that happens. This is something uh, Thomas also highlighted. That is the infrastructure layer. What I'm showing here in the green is the calls made to the infrastructure layer to create the base resources. And then um, that, are, that is the middleware that is installed on top of it. And it has its own dependencies in terms of how it has to be set up. 
And uh, the deployment manager for the middleware here actually requires a particular kind of dependency structure that needs to be uh, preserved so that first it needs to start, then the deployed nodes need to start, then it has to push something into the deployment manager. It will compute a profile for each one of them, then push it back to them so that they can put it in their nodes and get started. And then there, then there is an application that is put on top of it which has its own this thing. So you, you could see that the, the dependencies that needs to be like satisfied are at a very fine granularity and it appears at different levels. There are dependencies at the infrastructure components level, then also at the software components level. And uh, so deploying on OpenStack, I just want to give the big picture view now. Uh, so what we do today is take the Weaver source, in the sense the description of it, that is a compiler that does an analysis and maps it, and directly it uses the OpenStack API to deploy this. And when we do this, we use Zookeeper for software orchestration. And what we would like to do is instead actually generate a hot or heat template and uh, delegate the um, infrastructure creation, orchestration, and the software component creation and orchestration to heat so that um, um, we can actually leverage a lot of nice features that are there in heat. Uh, so to, for, for, to see the feasibility of it, we did a prototype of that uh, for uh, some applications. And uh, uh, in that prototype, uh, we use the current features in heat. And we are pretty excited to use the software component features that are coming up in heat. And in the current prototype, we had to use still our Zookeeper to do the coordination. But we are hoping that would go away once uh, heat has its coordination. So we could just use that. And so that is. Okay, thanks, Lakshmi. So, uh, and uh, to uh, wrap up the, the presentation, I'm going to quickly talk about some activities in, in the heat community. So, one of the hottest topics uh, from my perspective has been the, the discussions around software orchestration uh, to be added to heat and to the hot uh, language. Uh, because y you see, we have two solutions in IBM, at least two, I must say. <laughs> who are doing software orchestration and who can leverage heat as it is today for the infrastructure and then add agent-based or, or subkeeper-based uh, orchestration on top. And like, like in IBM, there are many solutions out there who have the same requirements. So I, I think the community, uh, is, it's clear to everyone that uh, something common like this uh, should be implemented in, in a, also in a common project. And the key goals for the software orchestration thing is really to go from the currently inline scripts in, in, in user data, for instances, and the, the concept of, of weight conditions, weight handles, which make it very complex to write a template sometimes, uh, and move that away towards a clear software component model, where you have the ability to model your software pieces to define de dependencies, uh, data flow dependencies, and so on, in a, in a hot template. Uh, to have better flexibility, clear separation of software from infrastructure, which also gives you more flexibility in deployment topologies because you can say two components should go on, to, uh, on the same server or on different servers without changing your component definitions. Uh, so that, that's all features that will be enabled. Uh, another design principle is to not duplicate things that are done otherwhere uh, in other Technologies like it should be possible to use Chef and Puppet without implementing the well the concepts that they already have. So it shouldn't be anything to add platform uh, agnostics to to software orchestration. But for that you could use Chef. And another very important point: it should be user friendly. So it should be possible for uh, a normally skilled person to write a heat template uh, and 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 define software components and how they should be deployed on the, on the infrastructure. And uh, well, there are actually two discussions, uh, at least from my perspective, and we, we had those yesterday in, in the design summit session. So one is, uh, what are the hot constructs, or the, the constructs in the hot language to define this? So will we have, how do we express software components? Also, how do we express dependencies and data flow between components so, so that we can do real orchestration? Uh, and the other one is how, how can this be implemented? So like how are the, the software configuration tools bootstrapped inside the instances? How is the metadata passed to those tools? How is the signaling done? Uh, 
to, to signal when one component is ready and the next one can be started. So those are all things that need to be solved. And again, here we can see what, what of the existing mechanisms uh, in the engine can be used, uh, but uh, without surfacing some of the complexities that we have today in, in a template. Another discussion we brought up was this discussion around policies and placement. So, we, well, like we said, there are requirements for pl placement, for high availability, for performance reasons, uh, constraints on networking connections and so on. And I, I would say this is not a heat or hot only discussions, but it requires very close interlock with other projects. So a lot of this has to be uh, dealt with in Nova or Cinder or Neutron. But from, from a heat and hot perspective, I think we should think of a way to uh, annotate a hot model in an intuitive way to, well, allow template writers to express those constraints. And then we, we have to discuss a way how, the, how this metadata gets passed today to the underlying services. So can I add something here? Yep. Um, so when, when I mentioned uh, the way we currently did the, connection, the experiment, so I did not show an important piece there. And in this picture, actually, here, um, in this place between the DSL compiler and OpenStack API, there is a component called a placement engine that is actually um, sitting in between and trying to find placement or placement and resources that satisfies those constraints, like the co-location policies, network uh, policies, et cetera. And uh, some of our colleagues here are now working with uh, the NOVA scheduler group and other groups to actually see how those, how that kind of a placement, more intelligent or more constraint-based placement could be actually incorporated into other components in OpenStack. I, I think once that evolves, then uh, this will become even more relevant, the ability to express these kind of policies at the heat level and then be able to exploit those underneath them. So, and uh, with that, I'm ending the presentation. So we are really looking forward to an ex exciting ice house development yeah. cycle. <laughs> and I just want to say it, it's been great working with the heat community. So I started in April and uh, I learned a lot. And, and in, in some cases, I'm sure we will have requirements and say this and this must be done. And uh, it's always good to have all the experts to talk to because sometimes they just tell it, oh, it already works, do it like this and that. And, and that's, that's actually amazing to get all this information and then work on things, work on closing the, the gaps together. So I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I, I also share the same thing. I should thank the HEAT community. They have been extremely welcoming in, for all the discussions and all the debates. So thank you very much. <laughs>